I want you to turn for a few minutes tonight to Mark chapter number 7. Mark chapter number 7 on page 1054. 1054 in the Old Schofield Bible. Mark 7 verse 5. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of, el of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied to you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, my friend, I've been studying a long time here lately about these things and false professors. Our Sunday school lesson has been dealing with it quite a bit in the book of Matthew. And we have it right here again. We have the difference in a possessor and a professor. Now, now we are talking about a person who is a true believer. And then uh, I'm talking about in Christ, really one who has accepted Christ and had a transformation. And one who is merely professing Christ but has had no conversion experience. There are many like that. Now, I'm not the judge and I'm not here to tell people that you are real or you are unreal. I'm not the judge. God only knows who is real and who isn't. But men can fool other men. They can deceive one another. In our churches across this land, there are many saved people that do not have blessed assurance all the time. Now, I deal with this a lot, and I know what I'm talking about. There are plenty of people that are saved by the grace of God that don't live as happy as they ought to live. They don't have the victory that they ought to have. Now, these live in doubts, and uh, they live in fear, and they are really miserable. A born-again believer that's having doubts about his salvation is a miserable person. And the devil likes to make any Christian doubt his salvation, so he'll be miserable. And when you're miserable, you're not a real testimony for God. You don't feel like witnessing for God, so the devil's got you right there. The devil can't take your salvation, but he can take everything else away from you. He can take your joy and your peace and your uh, gladness and all of that, and he can cause your family and your home to be messed up and all these other things. He's a powerful enemy. These saints of God do not fully understand the Scriptures is the reason they're in that condition. These do not really know with assurance that they are eternally safe. Now this confusion and this unrest comes because these do not make a difference where God makes a difference. They ignore the discrimination principle that we talked about the other night. When interpreting the Bible, we must never take a difficult passage and use it and try to make it contradict a more easily understood Scripture. Anything like John 3, 16, don't let anything contradict that. I don't care if that Mr. Dr. Wigglejaw over there comes down with some pretty little doctrine and says, well, you know, this does away with John 3, 16. Don't you believe a word of it? John 3, 16 stands just like it is. I've said it many times. I'll say it again. I believe the dirtiest sinner could be walking down Saluda Dam Road and see a little piece of paper on the side of the road, pick it up, and if it was only John 3, 16, and he read that and believed it, he'd go to heaven. You say, Brother Sammy, that's not that easy. It is that easy. Jesus has already paid everything, hasn't he? And if you read it and believe it, you believe it in your heart, accept it in your heart, you're a born-again child of God. It's not how long your prayers are, it's who you believe in. And brother, if you believe in Jesus, friend, you're in, you're home free. Now you have to tell the devil that every now and then. Some people cannot remember the day nor the hour they got saved and it bothers them. I don't know the exact day. I think it was on a Sunday night. It was in a revival. I'm pretty sure it was on a Sunday night, but I don't care whether it was or not. God knows. I don't know the time on the watch that I got saved. But I can, well, they've torn that little church down now, but I, I took some of our members there before and showed them exactly where my knees hit the floor when I asked Jesus to save me. I could take you to the place, but I couldn't tell you the exact hour or the exact time on the clock. It's not that hard to get saved. You just got to do it. You just got to make sure you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and receive Him into your heart by faith. <clears throat> some people can't remember those times. <clears throat> then, some people can't remember the exact prayer they prayed. 
but God remembers it. Some people that can't, you know, uh, have this good assurance that we have, some of us have tonight, because they're going by feelings all the time. Well, I don't feel like a Christian. I, I make mistakes. I just do things wrong, and I don't want to do things wrong, but I make mistakes all the time, and I just don't believe I'm a Christian. Listen, friend, don't you know the devil's laughing at you while you're saying all that, which you ought to say, I'm not worth a dime. I'm sorry as I can be, but I'm saved by the good grace of God. Hallelujah, I've been washed in the blood one good time, and what good time is good for time and eternity. Hallelujah, I'm sealed by the Holy Ghost, uh, and the devil and all of his imps cannot take that away. He cannot do one thing about it. What you need to do, get rid of all those thoughts. Did you know you can think of anything? Did you know that your mind can think of uh, in the next uh, minute, next one minute, you can think of a hundred different things just like that? I mean, you can travel around the world with your mind in a minute. But let me tell you something, just because you can think of a thing doesn't mean it's so. Sometimes you think of something, it is so. Sometimes you think of something, it's not so at all. And just because you think it doesn't mean that it's absolutely true. But I'll tell you, when you stand on thus saith the Lord, the Word of God, you stand on what God said, you cannot go down. God's Word is solid as the rock of Gibraltar. Brother, it'll stand when everything else falls apart. Now, this confusion and unrest comes because these do not make a difference where God makes a difference. They ignore the truths of God. Now, we need to rightly divide the truth. We need to rightly interpret the Word of God. Now, there are some scriptures that seem dark and difficult, but rest assured now, none of these hard and difficult scriptures will ever contradict another scripture. There is not one contradiction you can show me in the King James Bible, not one. And I dare you to try. I'd hate to have to call you what uh, I'm going to preach on before long. Now we have several, we have several examples in the Bible. I can't give them all, but let me read you one. Over in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good Word of God, and, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves the Son of God afresh, and put Him to open shame. Now this scripture is used often by the Armenians. I used to have them attack me with this verse till I learned what it meant, what it said. Now they believe that a man can be saved today and lost tomorrow, saved the next day and lost the next day, saved over and over and over again. I don't know how many times some of them claim to have been saved, but they claim to have been saved a lot of times. Uh-uh. They haven't, but they may believe that. <coughs> but they haven't been saved over one time because that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now we must realize that this was written to the Jews at a time when many were drawing back from their light of the new religion called Christianity. Now these, because of persecution, returned to old Judaism. After they had come close to accepting Christ, the persecution upon those Jews drove them back into old Judaism. Now this was written to the Jews when the temple worship was still going on. Judaism crucified Jesus Christ. These Jews had, appoint, had, had uh, apostatized, you can say, from Judaism, but had returned, had returned. Some people believe that these apostates could not get so close to Christianity without being converted to Christ. But notice five things that can prove what I'm saying. First of all, they had... They had been at one time enlightened as to the claims of Jesus the Messiah. They heard and they had the light given to them. He came under his own, his own received him not. That's the Jew. They had tasted the sweetness of the heavenly gift, but this does not mean in itself to imply that they had eaten of the living bread. Now they were made partakers of the Holy Spirit in the fact that it was not that the Holy Spirit had ever indwelt them, but they had enjoyed the blessing 
and the, that the Spirit had given. The Bible says, when it rains, it rains on the just and the unjust. When the sun shines, it sun shines on the just and the unjust. You know them rotten sinners out there cursing Jesus and drinking their whiskey tonight? They'll get up in the morning with the same rain that you and I'll have. If it's raining, they'll enjoy the same sunshine that you and I'll enjoy. God's letting them get the blessing right on, right on here in this life. They get it, brother. Those Jews were getting all of this. And they had tasted the good word of God, having listened to the good news of the gospel, and to a certain extent appreciated the message of a better day. And then they had been eyewitnesses of the works and the power of the coming new age, as well as were all who beheld the mighty miracles that Jesus Christ performed when he was walking on this earth. Now, what does all this really mean? Everybody who listens or hears the message of Christ is thereby enlightened. You are enlightened when you hear about Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. He lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now, whether they surrendered to him or not, that was their problem. Whether you surrender fully to G Jesus tonight, that's your situation. You can serve God with your lips and not have Him in your heart, or you can accept Him fully into your heart and be converted to Christ, be saved by the grace of God. Some people come to church, they'll sit right here with the rest of us. They'll sit right here. As soon as they get out here, they've got evil intentions. They've got sin already planned for tonight. They, when they get out of here and get away from us and get away from conviction and get away from the Word of God, get away from the singing, get away from all of this. They've got evil things on their mind, and they're going to commit sin willingly. Brother, those people serve God with their lips, but not with their heart. Now, Jesus said it, I didn't. So you can size it up any way you want to, but that's what he said, I just read it to you. So when we hear the gospel of the light, we can see the message and how that that message would dispel darkness. The sad thing is that so many people refuse the light. Jesus said, you won't come to the light. You could, but you won't. And they turn away from the light, and they go back into darkness. They come close to the light. They get a little taste of the light. They see a little bit of the light, and it sounds pretty good to them. But then they turn because of their old evil nature, and they go right back into darkness. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And if you go back into darkness after you hear Jesus Christ, you're evil. Your deeds are evil. So there are so many who have been deeply stirred as they listened to this gospel message of hope, but did not surrender to it. So many people came close to getting saved. Agrippa said, almost, Paul, you persuade me to become a Christian. Almost. Almost is not enough. You can come close. You can hear the light. Hear of the light. See a little bit of the light. And almost give your heart to the Lord, but then go to hell. Because you didn't come all the way clean with Jesus Christ. To be a partaker of the Holy Spirit is not the same as being indwelt, sealed, anointed, and born of the Spirit. It is simply to be made aware of the mighty works of the Holy Spirit. A person may be greatly convicted by the Spirit of God and still turn away. Many have sat and listened to the Word of God being preached and taught, but have failed to obey the Word of God. It amazes me, it amazes me that people in Truth Missionary Baptist Church, I would say one of the most fundamental churches in America, I would claim that, I believe that, that our church, we stand on the King James Bible, we believe in the blood, we believe in the book, we believe in the blessed hope, we believe in eternal security, we believe, praise God, once saved, always saved. We believe, praise God, all the devils in and out of hell couldn't take our soul. We believe, praise God, Jesus is greater than the devil. We believe, hallelujah, we're true believers tonight. We stand on the foundation, which is the Word of God. And the Word of God is not going to let, let us slip. The Word of God's not going to cave in, friend. The Word of God will support us till we get into the pearly white city. So hallelujah, you can shout your way from here to glory and spit in the devil's eye and tell him to go wherever he wants to go, but you are going straight to glory. 
Jesus did not say, He that tasteth of me shall live by me, but He said, He that eateth me. There's a difference in tasting something and eating it, right? You got sense enough to know that? You got gray matter. So, He said, He didn't say, He that has tasted, but He that eateth. Now, this is a spiritual partaking, you know that. Brother, we don't eat Him literally, but we do spiritually. He's the bread of life. He's the bread from heaven. He's living bread. He said, He that eateth me shall live forever. I have already, I've already dove in. Man, whenever Ann made a cherry pie, and I'm a diabetic, trying to kill me, I think. She thinks I got money and I got a dime. <laughs> trying to get rid of me. She made a cherry pie. I'm not lying, it's that big around. And I, about half of it's gone. She eats all of it. When I go to bed at night, she gets into it. But now, I love cherry pie about as good as I love anything on earth for, to eat. And I didn't just go in there and say, that's good. Get rid of it. Man, I got a piece, and then I got another piece. And I said, I'll pop a pill in a minute, but I'm going to eat this cherry pie. <laughs> so, listen, tasting and eating are two different things. There's a great there's a great difference in sticking your finger in the pie <laughs> and sticking your mouth into it. Amen. Eating it. Miracles and signs were given to, G to the Jews uh, to assure them that the ministry of Jesus was valid. He was truly their Messiah. Truly, truly, truly their Messiah. John says that many who believed on Him when they saw the signs they saw those signs, they believed. Yes, sir, they believed. Now listen to the Bible. He said they believed when they saw the signs that he did yet who went back and walked no more with him. After they had seen and they knew in their head, they turned before he got into their heart and no, didn't walk with him anymore. They might have served him with their lips and their, but their tongue, but they did not serve him from the heart. The power of Jesus was very evident, very evident to all of those Jews, every one of them. But they still turned away from Him, and in so doing, crucified for themselves the Son of God afresh, making a mockery of His power. That's what this is all about. These Jews turned from Christianity back to old Judaism. That is what is wrong right there in that scripture. Now, it is impossible to be renewed. Are you listening? It is impossible to be renewed by returning to Judaism. You may come to Jesus, hear about Jesus, believe in your head in Jesus, but to go back and say, I'll just live the way I was. I won't accept him in my heart. I'll just go back to my old religion and the old beliefs and all that. You won't be renewed that way. You're going to be lost. You're going to be lost. You've got to come on all the way and let Jesus come into your heart. Hallelujah. And He's ready. Now, these Jews turned from Christianity, and of course, renewal of the Holy Ghost is in Christ alone. In Titus 3.3, 3, the Bible says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lust." and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but after that the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. It didn't say that He's thinking about, you know, maybe getting us in someday. He saved us. That means we're saved. Saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Now, we have two words right here that have great significance. One is regeneration. Regeneration is a change wrought in the thought, the feeling, and the will of a man in his relationship to God and to the world. This regeneration comes at the new birth. No matter how religious one may be, he is not a child of God until he is regenerated, changed through and through by the new birth. 
Now the other word right here that I want to emphasize is the word renewing. Renewing means to make new. It is a restoration. This also pertains to the new birth. We receive Christ and new life. What was lost in Adam was gained in Christ. Judaism can't give you that change. It just cannot do it. But Jesus alone can. Another example of a difficult, and I'll close with this, another example right here of a difficult scripture being misinterpreted and misrepresented is Philippians 2.12. Work out your own salvation. Some people say, you know, and they've got on to me back then with this and said, Sam, you've got to work. You've got to work out. And you know, you've got you to work to get to heaven. I couldn't believe that because there are other scriptures that contradicted that. That saying, not the scripture. But listen, we have heard several different things about this. We all know that the scriptures clearly <coughs> teach. Now, if you don't understand this verse, you know that there are verses that clearly teach that we are not saved by works, right? Everybody in here can say amen to that. We are not saved by works, period. Now, the scriptures also clearly teach that we are saved by what? Grace, right? Grace, grace, undeserving kindness. You don't deserve to be saved, but you are. We deserve to go to hell, but we ain't going. Hallelujah. Jesus made it possible for every lost sinner in this world to go to heaven and be with him for all eternity. Again, salvation is of God. God works salvation into us, and we must work it out. We all know that there are those who remain faithful all the time, and there are others who stray. Now, we're not to judge the Word of God by the actions of and the experiences of men or the words that men speak. You don't judge this Bible by what somebody said. You, you judge them by what this Bible says. Yes, sir, don't let anything contradict this book because this book is perfect, absolutely perfect. Man, I'm just trembling, touching, the, and, and I'm not a fanatic. I'm just a nut. I mean, I don't want to explain it. I just believe, hallelujah. I just believe. So we are not to judge man's actions by, the, by, by his words or the Bible by his words. We are to judge him by the Bible. External life is one thing, but eternal life can never be lost. We can lose our fleshly life. We can be up here, you know, doing things and happy and all of a sudden dead. I'm going to talk about that later on in the sermon that I've been working on this week. Where do we get the doctrine of eternal life? Where do you get that, preacher? Right here in the Word. Right here in the Word. I didn't make it up. Now, God's Word is true. And when God says that a man is saved, then that man is saved. If God says it. Christians are working out what God worked in. The, dis the difference between a possessor and a mere professor is his character. A possessor has the nature of God bestowed upon him. A professor has no divine nature. A possessor is right in the sight of God. A professor has never been right with God. A possessor is one who really depends on Jesus Christ. A professor is self-centered. A possessor is a child of God. A professor is a creature of God. A possessor has a living vital relationship with God. A professor has no relationship with God. A mere professor can be morally good, very cultured, law-abiding, greatly religious, but still have no spiritual life within him. Do you know that? Just because somebody says they're religious doesn't mean they're saved. And I'm afraid that most religions are going to end up in hell fire. I tell you, there's only one true religion that will get you to heaven, and that's Jesus Christ. So, Brother Sammy, you're a bigot. I'm just a Bible preacher. Jesus said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way. He didn't say, I'm one of the many ways. He said, I'm the way. Brother, the way, the truth, and the life, the life. No man cometh unto the Father. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, brother, if you're going to the Father, you better go to Jesus. That's the only place you'll get to the Father. 
There are scriptures that speak of a real possessor. He's saved. He has eternal life. <coughs> He's free from the judgment of sin. He's saved from wrath through Christ. And I got scriptures here, but I don't have time to read them all. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. He's a child of God. Galatians 3, 26, and I love this. For ye are all, all children of God, children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So then that includes all of us. But I doubt, I, I don't care what you have. My Bible tells me if you believe on Jesus from your heart and you've accepted Him, you're a child of God. Now the Bible says He gives the Spirit to them that believe. Romans 8, 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but to ha you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He is identified with Christ. Romans 6, 5, For if we have been planted together in, his likeness, in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Now these are some of the scriptures that speak very specifically about a possessor are a true believer. And then there are scriptures that talk about the professor, one who doesn't have it but professes to have it. Jesus called them hypocrites. Boy, just right off the bat, he called them hypocrites. Now, if I were to call somebody in this church a hypocrite, they would be ready to shoot me, wouldn't they? <coughs> but Jesus said it. When he said it, he meant it, and it was true. And these uh, have been, they've been brought under the influence of the truth and Christianity and being brought under that influence have assumed a religion in appearance, but they lack the new birth. They did not get born again. There will, of course, be professors whom Jesus will declare one day, I never knew you. He is never going to say, I once knew you and you backslid and you got lost and then I just wrote you off. He's going to say, I never knew you. You never, I can't remember a time you ever got born again. You never got born again. I never knew you. So you better make sure he knows you if you want to go to heaven. And many of these are intellectually informed and intellectually, intellectually, intellectually reformed. They are both, but they're not transformed. And they got to be transformed. These know ritual as well as anybody, but they lack, they lack reality of the Spirit. So there is a difference in a, a possessor and a mere professor. Now which one are you? Are you somebody that's serving God with your lips? Now boy, you can put on a good religious show. Maybe you've got talent. Maybe you can sing. Maybe you can preach. Maybe you can witness. Maybe you can do a lot of things that appear to be just really on it. But down in your heart, you never Surrender to Jesus Christ. You'd rather feed your flesh and the desires of the flesh than to really serve God all the way. Now, only you know that. I don't know, and I'm not going to try to dig into anybody's life in this church. I'm not going to get on the computer and pick out somebody and say, I'm going to investigate. I don't investigate any of you. I'm telling you, God's got you. He knows your number. He knows your name. He knows the hairs on your head. And we must all appear before Him one day. Let's stand to our feet and close our eyes and bow our heads. If you want to come and pray for the revival, you come and pray and uh, just join in. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, you're not surrendered to Christ, not committed to Him fully, and you want to do that, you may come. And we'll be glad to pray with you, read the Bible to you, whatever we need to do. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we bow once again in the presence of a holy God. Lord, we want to say to you tonight, and you know very well who we are and what we are. You know our heart. But Lord, we want to praise you for giving us the Spirit of God, for letting us be indwelt and sealed unto the day of redemption. Lord, we're thankful for salvation that is so sure for all of us who believe. And I pray for someone tonight who might be having trouble with doubts or fears. Help them to dismiss those things and to stand on the Word of God. You said, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, 
and he shall direct thy path. You said, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. So, Father, we're trusting tonight. We're trusting souls. We believe the gospel. We believe that we're saved by the grace of God. We're going to stand on these doctrines until we see you face to face. And I pray that others will come and be saved too. I pray for revival. Lord, we're looking for you to revive our church, revive our homes. And Lord, even reach out in America and revive this country. God, will thank you and praise you for everything that you do. In Jesus' holy name, amen.